years. And uh, I joined the Guardium team. So Guardium is, was a product that IBM acquired about th three years ago. A really great company, market leading uh, data activity monitoring and protection software. And um, so I joined that about a year ago. And one of my very first assignments upon joining the team was to help the architect uh, write requirements to support MongoDB. Now, I'd heard a little bit about MongoDB because I knew the DB2 guys were looking at it. I wasn't sure exactly what it was. Um, got involved in the project. Um, Sundari, who's on my team, she was working already. We were working on the Hadoop support. We, we are actually first to market with data activity monitoring for Hadoop. And she's like, I want to be on that project too. So, so I said, okay, great. So she and I started working on the MongoDB support. At that point, our big boss said, you know, we have a client, we have a customer. He said, you know, we need to get validated. And we need to get validated with TenGen so that they can start, it's a big financial client, you're gonna hear more about it. Um, so they can start moving uh, MongoDB throughout other parts of the enterprise, okay? So that's how the three of us came together. Um, we, Sundari and Matt worked very closely on the phone for many hours, getting, uh, making sure that our uh, solution would work with TenGen, so we're now validated. And then the three of us put together an article, and so we decided, what the heck, you know, we're gonna come here and talk about um, some best practices, some things you can think about doing. I'm gonna try not to make it too product focused. You're gonna hear a little product stuff because that's how, um, you'll see when we get through here how it all works. So the agenda for today, uh, I, I already talked a little bit about um, why we started working together, and then Matt's gonna go into a little bit more of the use case of this particular client and why they chose MongoDB. Um, a little bit, I'm gonna go a little bit about the business drivers for data protection and a little bit of the architecture of our activity monitoring solution. And we'll, then we're gonna go through six steps to kind of get you on the way to thinking about security and protection. And then hopefully there'll be time at the end. Sundari's gonna do a live demo. If we do run out of time, we do, there's a break after this so we can, um, you know, we, people can gather up around and we can do it for anybody who's interested. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Callen from Tengent. Great, Kathy. Uh, okay, there it goes. So, um, yeah, this is only just in case people don't, aren't familiar with MongoDB. Uh, it's not obviously the focus of the session, but just so you understand, because it'll be useful when it comes up later, so you understand that MongoDB is a document database uh, and gives you the ability to store document data structures, like on the right side here. Um, is there a mouse? Anyone see a mouse? Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, can I point? Oh, there we go. Ah, great. So, yes, yeah, so you can see an example of a document data structure. And, you know, I'm sure many people here are familiar with it because it's a NoSQL conference. There's, uh, there's not a predefined schema. There's things that are introduced differently that, you know, people are accustomed to in a relational world that you don't get uh, in really most NoSQL or maybe all NoSQL databases. Um, and so that represents some challenges, and, and of course, in our work with Guardian, uh, it, it at least does, uh, they do have some solutions and help for this. Uh, also, MongoDB, you get you access from a native API, so it's a, a little different. There's not a SQL um, layer there. Uh, and then, so you're aware that MongoDB has um, kind of primary, secondary replication. So there can be up to maybe 11 nodes spread all over the world, so it really is a distributed database. Uh, and horizontal scalability as well. So behind a cluster, you just keep adding more and more nodes. So, uh, and it auto partitions or auto shards. So many of these are kind of different. It makes it a cluster very large. It makes monitoring it maybe a little harder. Um, but just to give you a sense of kind of a snapshot of Mongo. Now here was the real case study that brought us together, uh, just to see that NoSQL really is, is getting um, really huge business value, driving real huge business value in many firms. Uh, the, the problem here was that this large investment bank, you know, top three in size, they had up to 36 hours in distributing the reference data globally. Uh, and what that happened is they would get charged multiple times because reference data would maybe start in New York when they loaded it from a Bloomberg or Reuters of the world, uh, and this is in capital markets, as, as uh, it says their investment bank. And Australia wouldn't get that data for so long, so they would ask Bloomberg or Reuters for the same data. So you have this large bank getting charged quadruple, maybe 10 times for the same data. Uh, so that was a huge cost there. 
there were regulatory penalties for missing SLAs because this data took so long to spread, and there were some 20 distributed systems with the same data. Um, and if you look at it graphically, this is really what they were doing, loading the data into New York, and they had batch processing. They were using ETL, but not doing the T in ETL. They were kind of just moving data along and, and not really transforming it much. Uh, and of course, each of these systems represents people dollars, hardware, license dollars. I talked about the penalties and, and other downstream issues of doing this, right? Uh, so their solution with Mongo was to, and this is, this is the main one that got a large deal, some thousand server years sold, uh, and this was maybe uh, 50 of them or so. Uh, and what happened is they decided, let's make a primary in New York, and this was just real, use real-time replication to send this data all over the world, because actually, we're not doing the T in transform, so we're just replicating data. Why not just do it this way, right? Uh, so if you look at the results and the benefits, uh, you know, they're planning on saving $40 million in costs and penalties over five years, so really great business case. Only charge once for the data. You get all the operational benefits of all the data in sync globally, uh, and they have extra capacity to put more and more reference data onto the same platform, which is nice. So it's kind of a one-stop shop instead of 50 different reference data systems or so. Uh, and you know why Mongo was a great fit is a dynamic schema, as you see in many NoSQL databases, the fact that you could bring all this data together into one place and not have to manage the schema in yet another location. It's already managed upstream. Why do I want to manage it in another place when it's just a pass through to getting reference data to all the applications built uh, downstream? And you know other benefits certainly that we're kind of a cache and a database. Um, so you can really you can read from those local replicas at in-memory speeds. Uh, and such. So just so you know kind of the context of, of um, you know, this large customer, large to both of us, uh, said we needed to work together and it actually did um, help in general because now we can talk about really architecting a secure compliant system uh, and it helped get the deal done too, which is always nice. So back to Kathy and I'll come back later. So uh, I, I got this, I was reading, um, I, I don't know, I, I started cruising the web about uh, system administrators and you know, the different system administrator personality types and et cetera, and I found this in one of Bob Cringley's columns and I thought it was really appropriate. So um, you know, that's there for you guys. Uh, so, but seriously, um, system administrators, you know, hacking, I mean, there are th all kinds of threats. Uh, we know about this. This is probably why most of you are in this room, because you're sort of, you're either in an industry that's regulated, that you have to comply with, or, you know, maybe you're just a good citizen. But, th but the point really is, you know, there are many more, you know, external threats, a lot of uh, uh, organized crime getting into it, uh, and, you know, national security issues. Um, there's internal threats, you know, just plain dumb things that people do or, you know, getting too many people sys admin privileges as we witnessed at the NSA. Um, compliance, and that's really probably the major reason why most, most people, uh, you know, buy our solution is because there's, there's a lot of mandates around uh, in industry, payment card industry data security standard, which is actually a very excellent standard in terms of actually protecting your data. Uh, data privacy. You know, I was thinking about MongoDB and, you know, um, the fact that so much information is in a single document, you know, you don't have, like with relational, you could have a driver's license here and, a, you know, an address there, and it might be a little tougher to piece it together to actually, you know, violate a standard. But with data privacy, you know, with everything in one document, you know, maybe there's more, even more of an issue. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Um, so these are just use cases of you know various breaches. Um, this was you know hackers. You know, think well you know all these NoSQL systems are very new. You know hacking isn't necessarily going to be you know the biggest issue. People aren't really targeting yet. But the thing is, it's going to happen, right? As they become more mainstream, there's going to be a lot more opportunities for hackers to exploit it. SQL injection. Well, we've heard about JSON injection, JavaScript injection. So. I mean, that is something that could happen as well with uh, the NoSQL databases. Um, unprotected test data. This is a case where, you know, ev even if you're working with test data, you need to de-identify it or mask it or whatever. So, I mean, there's a lot of the, the data privacy standards and PCI are very strict about that. So these are all things that you need to think about. Um, okay, so this is very simple. Why do people, you know, need to comply? One, you know, prevent data breaches. 
because a data breach is not only expensive if you have to pay fines or you have to mitigate the problem, it's also very embarrassing and it's very bad for your reputation as a business. Assure data governance. You want to make sure that either uh, the internal users are not making inappropriate updates or changing data to in some way um, invalidate or um, you know, misrepresent your business. Finally, to do all this, people don't, I mean, it's not necessarily everybody's favorite topic. Compliance can be quite cumbersome. There's a lot of overhead. You need to uh, work with auditors. You need to validate and prove that you're doing the right things. So you want a solution that's going to hopefully be automated and is and well integrated into your business process and therefore reduce the overhead. You also may probably don't want to get into the business of writing your own tools to scrape logs, read logs. And even by doing that, you know, if you want to do that additional overhead, you have the issue of separation of duties. So if you have the same people who are managing the database, who are managing the audit data, then you have a real problem there with a the possibility you know, of uh, privileged user um, um, modifying or hiding their tracks. So here's um, my exciting animated graphic. This is uh, a little bit of the architecture. And the only reason I'm going into this now is because you, it'll help you understand a little bit of uh, some of the visibility that this system brings you. So the way it works is that uh, so clients are issuing their Mongo calls. And in a sharded environment, they all go through the routing server, so Mongo S. And that gets routed out to all these data shards. When what we're doing is we have these little lightweight agents that are called uh, software taps that are sitting uh, on the data server. And they're basically doing a quick copy of the network uh, message. And so what, then what happens is so the overhead on, the, on these servers is extremely low because it's, it's a very you know, low cost operation. It's sent over to this hardened appliance. There's no root access to anybody to this appliance. Um, it could be hardware, software, appliance. And that's where all the heavy lifting takes place. So this is where the message is parsed. It is uh, broken into our uh, repository there. And from there, it, the only way to access this is through reports, graphical or tabular reports. Uh, there's a quick search facility. Also, while it's processing this, you can be getting real-time alerts. So if you have a security policy, for example, that says you know, a, da a privileged user is not able to read uh, certain sensitive data, you can generate an alert. And those alerts, of course, can be sent off to a SIM system or other um, uh, enterprise-wide monitoring tool. And as I mentioned, there is separation of duties because you know, this is all controlled by a separate administrator. Um, that person does, you know, even that person doesn't have uh, access to the root data, to the root, um, to the system where all that auto data is stored. And finally, this solution has been validated by our friend Matt over here on behalf of Tengen. So here are some six steps that we're going to go through. So I'm just going to work through these pretty quickly. Know where your sensitive data is. You don't necessarily want to need to monitor and protect as deep a level everything. Evaluate the risk factors. Restrict access to need to know. So make sure that you don't, uh, as much as you can, leverage the controls to, the low, to the, whoever needs to really know of the data. Encrypting sensitive data. So this is encrypting data at rest or you know, um, on the wire. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, implement database activity monitoring. These are all things that are very common in many of the state security standards. This is what gives you visibility and auditability. Okay, And you're going to see a little bit more about the visibility here and the benefits it can bring you, because not only are you doing for security, but you're going to see that you can also um, uh, see what, what's going on. Or what, when are new fields being added? Is somebody using JavaScript? We, 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 we now have visibility into what's going into the system that you may not have had before. And then finally, to, you need to centralize this management. You can pass um, alerts or uh, audit data to a centralized system, uh, such as a key radar or a Tivoli or something like that for centralized management. So you don't necessarily want or have to monitor uh, and audit everything. Um, so I, I saw earlier where somebody said, um, 
You know, if you have sensitive data, put it into a separate collection. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really good advice. Um, one issue, of course, is that you may not have control, so you're going to have to set up some kind of control around, um, around what goes into your, into your database and where and which collections. I was thinking about this on the light rail the other day, and I thought to myself, you know, how are, how are people going to know? We don't right now have an automated discovery tool to go through and crawl like we do on some of the relational systems. You know, we can actually do discovery of patterns, you know, like a credit card pattern or a, you know, an, an email address or something like that, sensitive data, driver's license numbers. Um, but what you could do is like with, the, with a, the monitoring solution, you can say, well, you know what? I know what all my fields are. This is my ab application. It's, it's using these fields. With monitoring, I can have that, that be a known set. And if anybody, because it's not a fixed schema, right? So I don't have a catalog you can go to and say, oh, MongoDB has these fields and these, you know, whatever. Well, if somebody does insert a new kind of data, a new field, extends a field, you know, you could be made aware of that through these reports. So that might be a way to kind of at least get some level of control or understanding of what's going into the system. And again, try to think about your methodology for how you're to control uh, sensitive data, um, you know, uh, before you start building it. Okay, step two, so evaluate your risks and vulnerabilities. Uh, this is where you need to kind of prioritize the risk factors. So obviously what you're going to do is always keep, you know, make sure you, you keep in touch with the vendor and what their best practices for security is. And the Tenjoin guys have a really nice wiki. I, just, I, I think it's really excellent. And they have some really good advice on there about managing security. Um, you know, are you using the default ports? Well, they say, you know, changing the, you know, the default to a non-default isn't really going to buy you anything, and I think they're right. Um, but, you know, you could change a default port, but with port scanners tools, it might buy you five seconds. Um, make sure that you're using authentication, because I don't, it's not the default. Um, with the new to, uh, release of MongoDB, you know, maybe take a look at their new roles, and, um, and Matt's going to talk about that. And that'll help you control granularity of, of access. Make sure your IP bindings are correct. You're not exposing anything to the outside world. And they also have security notifications. So make sure you're subscribed to whatever the security notifications are. And the next thing I want to talk about in terms of risk is a way to identify connections. So this is where you can determine, you know, is this a risky connection because of something I don't know? Why, is this IP address and this, is this known to me? Should I be letting this through? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and a way to automate the process for reviewing those unknown connections. OK, so there's many types of risks. Now, this is kind of a banking example. Um, and on, uh, who are the unauthorized users? You know, for example, I may have an authorized user that the application user is allowed to access this database server. I mean, that's, that's, this is what it does. But is Joe supposed to be accessing, you know, the private customer data, my privileged user? Probably not. IP addresses. So I, may, I know my application server IP. He's supposed to be coming in here. This is correct. But this is not an IP that is allowed to, come and to connect to my system. Programs, you know. So I know my application is, you know, is using online banking. I know that's an authorized uh, program. You know, Joe's using some kind of an export utility or something. He's not supposed to be using that here. So these are all the various risks um, and connections that can occur. So this is what we're going to call an unauthorized connection. So make we have user, IP, uh, program name, et cetera. So all these together, um, we can, you can sort of create this tuple. You know? So if you have a tuple of you know, this, 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 and this, the uh, source IP, client IP, username, um, you can actually start understanding. If you know what your authorized connections are, you can put those into what we call a connection profiling list. Anything that is not a known connection, so here, for example, these are all uh, connections that I don't know about. I can actually add those to a report and automatically forward those for review to the appropriate um, reviewers. Okay, 
So this is a way to say, you know, to kind of get a handle on who's connecting in into your database. And the fact that we can automate that process for review and then add them back into the group so the next day I can update my security policy. These guys are going to be known at that point if I've approved them. Okay, so I approve them. They get added to the group. Everything's cool the next day. I never have to think about it. I don't have to worry about it again. But if there's another unknown connection, I will be alerted. Okay, step three, restrict access. Um, so uh, here's one, the role methodology, one of the things you want to think about is who can access what data and what level of authority do they need to have. And one of the things you're going to learn with Guardian is that if you have this plan in place, you know, so and so can access information, so and so can access that information, you can actually automate all the, um, uh, that'll actually feed into how you build your security policies. So anytime I have a privileged user, that person cannot access this collection using this type of command. So those are the kinds of things that you can build into a security policy. Um, so, so evaluate the current entitlements and then monitor new ones going forward. So we're going to show you a little later how you can actually um, see whenever anybody adds a new user to your MongoDB system, you can get a report and that you'll see that every, uh, you know, as often as you like and you can make sure that nobody's adding inappropriate users with inappropriate levels of authority or of, uh, uh, control. And if you're really desperate, you also have the uh, ability to block. So we ha you can have a security policy that says, if I have some unknown connection accessing, maybe you have some highly sensitive data, and you don't know where these people are coming from, you can actually cut off the connection before the data is actually returned to those users. These are all capabilities that uh, you can use to help restrict access. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, authentication Perfect. Yeah, just so you are aware of, you know, what's specifically in MongoDB. And, and I think most people understand that in NoSQL, a lot of the security uh, features are less than relational, right? Because it's a 30-year-old technology. Almost all the features you can imagine have been built into it, right? So I'm going to review what's in MongoDB. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely simpler. So your are two options really currently in, in version 2.4x our basic username password, there's a hash in stored in the database, so at least not a password stored in the database. But then certainly in our, in our enterprise version, most and our large enterprises want uh, to centrally manage their passwords, right? So instead of the passwords being in Mongo, we can integrate with a, with a key distribution center within Kerberos uh, over SASL. And so, you know, most importantly, enterprises can still manage their username and passwords centrally in their permissioning system. You can enforce whatever, you know, special characters or uh, three, lo uh, three tries for a password locks the person out. So, you know, that, that has been uh, a nice win for enterprises to centrally manage things. Uh, and in 2.6, which is currently planned in Q4, we'll have some LDAP integration as well for authentication. Uh, and then in terms of authorization, as Kathy alluded to, there are roles that are fairly coarse. I'll go through them in a, in a second. There's not like a super user in MongoDB. It's really a segregation of rules, so which, you know, it's kind of a better practice, I think, that, you know, you don't have a root access to everything in the database. You add roles together if you want to build that to a, a certain user, and I'll discuss, uh, you know, I'll discuss that. Um, and then custom roles are planned also for later in the year. And so you know what the roles are currently available, and it's pretty coarse, right? So we don't allow authorization, or we don't enable authorization on a document or record level. It's really at a database level. So per database, you can give a user or an application access to read-only or read-write, and, the, um, and then you have database administrator and a user administrator. So a DBA can't read and write, so that's where the segregation of rules comes in, and, and that's why you can combine these roles together. And then if you want to, so this is just for within that database, if you want to deal with things at the node or the server level, like adding to a replica set or sharding and partitioning across nodes, you set that permission in the admin database. Uh, you can also do uh, roles that go across all databases, like giving a user uh, access to be DBA for all the databases in that server or a user admin for all databases on that server, and same with read and read-write. So how that looks for a larger enterprise, uh, you know, it's simpler for smaller, right? There might be two people that, that manage that. But in enterprise, 
you would give, let's say, in a central permissioning group, you'd give those people user, admin, any database permissions, but that's all they can do. So, you know, again, you're only giving them the access they need. Um, you might give one D, uh, DBA access um, to be able to configure the cluster, and maybe he can uh, create indexes and, and collections and things on each individual database. But you can also delegate access to, uh, to all, for each application, you might have one database within a larger server. That's the kind of nomenclature in Mongo. You can have a server with multiple databases, and the collections or tables are within each database. So uh, for each application, you might give it its own database with read-write access from the application in production. Developer users only in dev and test, you might give them read-write. And then um, for a DBA just for that application, you might give them DBA admin access just for that database. So just to kind of put it in context and give an example of kind of fairly coarse um, authorization uh, in Mongo. And to that end, if you want more you know, single record authorization, that really is built into a data access layer. You know, it's kind of up to the customer or the user to build a data access layer. I would not have multiple applications go to MongoDB directly if you needed to put a lot of authorization in there. I'd recommend you know, a well-encapsulated data access layer. And this is kind of a common paradigm with Mongo in general, in fact. Um, you know, put an API in front so that the applications all go through one common access layer, and there you can have governance and, and really processes around giving access. Um, you probably don't want to expose it, uh, all of those applications straight to, to the database. Okay. Go ahead. Curry, right now, yeah. Um, we are aiming, I think, in two... Two six. Oh, sorry. The question was, uh, do we give authorization at a collection level? I believe in two six towards the end of the year we are, but yeah, not right now. It's just at the database level. Okay. Okay. Hand the back over. Okay. So here's what I was leading to earlier. Um, here's an example of what you can uh, maybe a report you might want to automate. It's kind of nice. Um, so who who created the user? In this case, for example, we see. Uh, Sundari is the username, and so she created these users. Um, and also, if you get a more detailed message, you can actually see uh, the roles that they were assigned that he was just referring to. And again, that can be completely automated using uh, the scheduling, so do what we call an audit process builder. You schedule this process to run periodically. You can add who the reviewers are. Do they get a PDF, CSV, or whatever, or a direct link to the report? So these people can review and what their action is, do they have to review, do they have to sign, whatever. And here is the actual report that you can run. And so here's just an example. I, I, I set up this audit process all by myself, which is, of course, a miracle. Anyway, um, user privileges. On my, so here I just got in my Gmail account that this, you know, here's my uh, report, and I can just click on it, and then I can go in and, you know, review it and approve it or, or whatnot. So this is a good way to kind of keep track of what's happening in the system in terms of um, automating any of these reports, not just uh, re roles. So uh, obviously encrypting data is sort of a basic, you know, fundamental thing. Um, we all know what, most of us know what encryption is. Um, what we're going to talk a little bit about here is encrypting data at rest, and we're using the file level encryption for that. And on the wire, so uh, MongoDB does now support SSL between the uh, client and the, and the servers, and actually inter-server as well. Um, here's one of our offerings. I know that they had mentioned that they partner with Gazang for encryption. This is the uh, Guardian offering as well. And it's, it's a file system agent, a very, again, a very similar architecture in a way to our Guardian DAM, the data activity monitoring, in that it's got a lightweight agent that's sitting on the server. We have a separate hardened kind of a console here where the key management and security policies take place. And this is really uh, completely heterogeneous. I mean, you can use it on any databases and applications, et cetera, because it's sitting at this file system level. Um, so anyway, this is a very recommend, this is a recommended pr uh, process. Uh, it guards against you know, root access, um, you know, so tape falling off the truck, et cetera. And, uh, and it's very low, very, very low overhead um, on the data servers as well. Um, okay, so a little bit about data activity monitoring, which is maybe the core of what I came here to talk about. 
So this is often a, this is actually a step that is required in many, in many of the standards. So you need to have a detailed, verifiable audit trail of, of the database activities. Um, so some example, examples of what things most people need to monitor at some point are user activities, mostly specifically you know, privileged users. You want to, that's something that a lot of people need to do. Um, you, you can look at user creation, and object creation, and manipulation. So you can see who's inserting, deleting, um, who's, who's dropping collections, who's adding collections, who's changing data. And then the thing that I think is of particular interest is um, you know, we had read that uh, server-side, arbitrary server-side um, JavaScript, so can cause uh, security risks. So you will actually be able to see the use of those JavaScript in our reports. So that might be a handy little thing to do if you're doing code reviews or anything like that. Um, you know, you're trying to QA a new application. Just make sure that no, nobody's using this, uh, this, uh, you know, this practice, or at least make sure that they're using it safely. Um, again, gaining visibility into all database activity involving sensitive data. So again, you're not necessarily going to monitor everything. You're going to monitor, you're going to really want to focus on the high priority uh, sensitive data. So who and what and when and, and how they're doing it. So you're going to get all this uh, activity. And in real time, you can get, generate real time alerts for anything that's outside the normal, any anomalous activity, any unknown connections, anybody who's doing something they're not supposed to do, you can generate real time alerts. And again, I mentioned briefly that we do have a pretty, uh, pretty nice workflow process that you can disseminate. It's at each level of review in the process uh, can be signed off on, and that's part of the audit trail. So you're able to keep that store it, um, you can, you know, once you get the report and all the audit trail and all the signatures and it's saying that everybody's reviewed it and done what they need to do, you can offload that report and keep it for as long as you, as required by your, uh, by your organization for uh, meeting your compliance um, requirements. Uh, here's just a couple examples, um, just to see the kind of uh, visibility that you get. So here in MongoDB is a simple credit card find. And so you can again see here we have the time, we have the client IP, the server IP, the username of who issued it. This is called SQL, but these reports are completely modifiable. So you could call that you know, detailed message or whatever you want to call it if you don't like that. Um, and the object, and you know, so basically what this is saying is the fact that we actually parsed this, this message out. We give the, the uh, collection is the, um, object name and the verb is fine, which is the command. So you can actually do things like create security policies that are built around whatever particular object or uh, action you should do if I get a find or if I get a delete or whatever. So this is all kind of based on what is actually flowing across the wire for using the MongoDB wire protocol. Here's an example of an update. Here's something that we just added. Um, this is a, basically a kind of an ad hoc quick search type capability. So it's, you can see over on the left we have the histogram or the, or the faceted search. So I can say my DB type is Mongo. I want to see who dropped something. So somebody calls me up and says, somebody just dropped one of our collections. What the heck's going on? So you can get in here and say, OK, uh, you know, select the DB type Mango, select the verb of drop. And then I can see the filter result. And I can see here that somebody dropped my, you know, credit card uh, object, you know, and when they did it and who did it. So all that would be in the result of my, of my search. Okay, so that's, a, that's like the super high level of the activity monitoring. Again, I didn't want to make this a pitch about activity monitoring, so anybody wants more details on that, I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, and again, I mentioned the, how are we doing on time? Oh, good. So I mentioned the, um, the ability to send alerts. So we have the ability that all those alert messages, like um, uh, privileged user accessing credit card data, that alert, you don't have to sit there and monitor you know, the Guardian you know, incident management thing. You don't even have to have it sent to your own email. If you want to, you can have it sent you know, to um, you know, your enterprise monitoring system that you have. And so we support, you know, basically, it's, it's uh, formats that can go to any of these in, in any, any, any uh, you know, uh, enterprise monitoring system or SIM system that supports certain message formats we can send that to. 
And the nice thing about that is you get this sort of enterprise view. So, you know, the Guardian, uh, any of the alerts for any of the databases that we support, NoSQL, Data Warehouses, Hadoop, any alert from any of those, because our security policies, all of this is cross database. It's not just Mongo, it's not just whatever, right? So all of this is cross database. You get an alert from any of those systems that gets generated from, the, from here, and it gets sent to your, your, uh, to your centralized management system. And then I, also the nice thing about that is something like QRadar with the you know, security intelligence, is they can correlate it with other things that are happening in the system, like. Uh, port attacks or anything like that and see if there's something bigger going on. And one of the things about breaches is like most people don't know they're happening. You know, but they, they'll go months before it's even discovered. And when it is discovered, it's usually discovered by somebody, you know, a customer or somebody that you don't, really don't want to have to discover it. So it's nice to have this sort of heads up before things get out of control. And just a brief thing about the scalability, you know, you're dealing with a scalable, uh, Mongo is a scalable platform, uh, Garium is also scalable, so this is just the individual collectors, so you may have a certain number of, you know, nodes or that can actually send data to a one collector, but they, you can use an aggregator to kind of federate the view across all those different collectors. And again, many of our customers are using um, um, Guardium across, you know, international boundaries as well. And I wanted to mention that, as I did mention that earlier, is that you, know, you want to be able to use common security policies across. You want, you want to be business driven. You don't want to have to be this database versus that database versus that, that database. Your security policies are usually driven by the security organization and what your business requires. And so we do have a common platform that works across many, many different systems. NoSQL, many of the Hadoop distributions, uh, traditional warehouses. Here's a little bit of that, you know, the international kind of look. Um, you know, and MongoDB, and, um, which we're really proud of uh, doing and, and working with the TenGen guys on this. It's been really a great experience. And uh, so that's that. So I wanted to mention that um, the three of us, as I mentioned, we did a pretty detailed article on how to uh, set all this stuff up and some use cases, how to do alerts, how to do the search. So that's on DeveloperWorks. Uh, we, did a re we did a webcast together, I think it was in May, end of May, and that's on there as well. And an ebook, and I oxymoronically have here um, several copies of the ebook, so it's on paper. If anybody's really interested in taking a copy, I only have a few. Um, but for those of you who are really interested, I, I do would like, you know, you're welcome to it. It's about, you know, considerations for NoSQL security. We do support more than just Mongo. And I hope you all will think about staying. We do have a couple extra minutes. Sundari is going to do a demo. And um, how are you going to do that? Going to come here? So we can take questions while she's getting set up. Questions for me or Matt? Matt? Um, 